iPads have come a long way over the last couple of years. They've gone from what I can best describe as a big iPhone or e-reader with a pen, slowly inching closer and closer to being able to replace people's laptops or desktops. In fact, I know some people who have actually done that and with the release of iPadOS 17 and tools like Final Cut Pro, I've been really curious as to what taking that plunge actually looks like. So today I'm trying to take this trusty little iPad Air and use it to power my whole creative setup and see if it's actually usable. I'm gonna dive into both productivity related and creative apps and workflows, what it actually takes to set something like this up and check out the positive positive and negative aspects of working like this. So if this has crossed your mind at all and you're considering doing the same thing or you just wanna know how to set all this stuff up, stick around and let's get into it. Hey everyone, Kyle Erickson here. The iPad has been a confusing product to me over the last three or four years. They started cramming super powerful chips in here, but for a long time, there didn't feel like a practical scenario where that extra power would really matter. For instance, I bought the M1 iPad Air on launch, and to be honest, at the time of purchase, there wasn't really anything that I could do on the fifth gen Air that I couldn't do on the fourth gen. When I got it, I was more so betting that somewhere along the line, it would make more sense, and I think we're finally at a point where it does. One year later, the power that's in these machines can finally be used to their full potential. There's some pretty amazing functionality that's been added to iPadOS since then. The number one on that list is a feature that makes all this possible and that's had an important update in iPadOS 17, Stage Manager. Stage Manager allows you to extend out your display. So rather than just mirroring it, which just turns your monitor into a giant iPad screen of what you can already see, which was the case pre-Stage Manager, it turns your external display into its own fully independent screen, behaving a lot more like a laptop or a desktop. There are a few things that you need to get Stage Manager Manager to work so that it is like a desktop. One is obviously going to be a monitor and the other will be a keyboard and mouse. You can either buy a keyboard case combo, which is doable, but if you want more of a real desktop experience with a little more versatility, you can use a regular keyboard and mouse and pair it with an iPad stand like I'm using. Having a stand is much nicer for a setup like this in my opinion because it gives you more options in how you use or place your iPad, especially with the one that I have here, the Moff Snap Float Folio. Now, full disclosure, Moff is this week's sponsor, but honestly, I've been using the stand for a couple of weeks and it's been great. And there's really nothing like it that I've seen or tried before. Not only is this super unique in both how it looks and operates, but it is very functional as well. The Snap Float Folio just snaps onto your iPad, as the name suggests. And at a glance, it just looks like a regular folio accessory, but it does have some tricks up its sleeve. For a desk setup like this, I can just fold back the flaps from the center on the back. And it not only gives me a landscape stand, but it also raises it up as well. So it's a little less awkward if I have it sitting beside a monitor monitor or on a desk. Sometimes when you have these things sitting down on a desk, it can feel like you're looking down at the screen all the time. So having it propped up a little bit makes things a little more comfortable. Having said that, I can still have it sit a little bit lower if it makes sense. Like if I'm using this as a secondary display for my MacBook, or if I want to use the Apple Pencil, say if I'm doing design work, I can put it in drawing mode. If you do want a little extra protection for both your iPad and to secure your Apple Pencil, you can also pick up the Moth Snap Case for iPads that works with the Snap Float Folio or with other magnetic accessories like the Apple Magic Keyboard. I believe you get a bit of a discount if you buy it with a folio from the Moth website. That will cover all the corners of your iPad, offer full protection, and has a pencil slot for your Apple Pencil, which allows it to clip into place just like it normally would. It shields it from any impact and still allows it to charge. That outside material is all scratch and discoloration resistant, so it is quite durable. And in regards to this folio, it comes in three different colors jet black, sienna brown, or light gray, and the ones that I have here are black and light gray. These are extremely versatile, whether I'm using them around the house in drawing or focus modes as a secondary display to my MacBook, or obviously in a desktop space like the one that we're going over here today. Once I have the iPad in the stand, I can pair it up to my keyboard and mouse, both of which have multi-device Bluetooth support. So the nice thing is I can pair up my Mac and my iPad and just toggle between them as I see fit. Once those are connected to the iPad, I can plug in my monitor directly into the iPad via USB. BC and use Stage Manager and voila, I have a desktop iPad set up. Now I can hop into the settings and extend out my display, move windows around between devices. And with iPadOS 17, Stage Manager has actually been improved. So there's a lot more functionality in terms of me dragging windows around between screens and how I place each window. Previously, while you could still have multiple windows open on each display, things were just a lot more rigid in terms of where they were placed and how they were sized. So this just feels a lot more desktop like now than it did before. iPadOS 17 is still in early beta. So there are still some bugs in terms of 
how things look being stretched out or condensed when you adjust them, but I don't expect that to show up in a production release and we're still months away from that. For things like productivity, I actually think I prefer working on the iPad in a lot of instances versus Windows or Mac. Because I have specific apps for things like Google Docs or Notion combined with Stage Manager on the iPad, Everything feels like it just has an extra degree of separation. When I'm writing a video script or project planning, it's just a lot more focused, and I think you're less prone to being distracted and pulled into another direction. There are times when the separation on an iPad does seem to have more of a negative or at least a different feel than Mac OS. Dealing with files is one of those situations where you'll use the files apps instead of the finder window for file management. Finder on Mac OS feels like an underlying part of the operating system that's actually attached to everything, but the files app on iPad feels, you guessed it, like an app. It has gotten a significant overhaul over the last few versions of iPadOS for things like dealing with file extensions, native external drive support, which we will touch on in a couple of minutes, and common and advanced menu features for things like getting file info and moving around and managing your files. I find if you're just doing light productivity on here that is cloud-based, like things in Google Docs or Notion, this really isn't something that you need to worry about. And the setup as it stands right now is really all you need to have a decent desktop experience in relation to those things. The other thing that I will caution is sometimes the scrolling on third-party mice can feel a bit janky when you're using a wheel instead of touch. So using a touch screen when you need to or a magic mouse might be your best option there. It's still totally usable, but depending on the app, it can get annoying. With some lighter creative workflows, you can probably get by with just the iPad monitor, keyboard, and mouse. Whether that's using Procreate Lightroom or the Affinity Suite to a lesser extent, Affinity Photo and Designer are a bit weird in that if you put them on an external display, the UI disappears on you. I believe that's to do with how it's coded and the APIs that they're using under the hood. But if you keep those apps on the iPad screen, the external display just shows your entire image that you're working on. It's nice that they make use of that space. It's usable, but not ideal. And those are really the only apps that I found are weird in that sense. Otherwise, basically any of these tools that allow you to create images or vector art or edit photos are totally fine. And again, if you're just working with smaller files or a small number of files, this setup will probably serve you well. If you got a bunch of raw photos from a digital camera, if you're video editing or just generally working with larger files, that's where you might want to expand things a little bit in terms of ports or storage. And this is where things can get a little more complicated, especially on the iPad Air. The iPad Air can only go up to 256 gigs of internal storage. And if you're a photographer or content creator, that can fill up pretty quickly. So having external storage storage does become kind of a necessity, but there's one problem with that. Because the iPad Air only has a single USB-C port and we need that port to not only drive the display, but add on other things like SSD drives or SD card readers, and also power the iPad, we're gonna need some kind of hub and this is where you're likely gonna have to make some trade-offs. The Air differs quite a bit from the Pro in that the USB-C port will only support up to 10 gigabit per second transfer speeds where the Pro goes all the way up to 40. So if you've got the Pro, you're likely not gonna have this issue, but if you've got a 4K monitor like mine, the Air's gonna need almost that entire bandwidth to run the display. The LG Ultrafine that I have is quite nice in some aspects working with an iPad. It has up to 90 watts power delivery via the USB-C display input, so it's more than adequate in both grabbing the video signal from the iPad and powering it at the same time. And there's also a built-in USB hub feature that does work meaning that it is possible to use this monitor alone with the iPad and do everything that you really need with a big catch. As it stands, I've got full 4K at 60 Hertz. I can see my SSD in here with everything on it, but if I go and run a speed test, you'll see that it's painfully slow. If I run the same drive directly on the iPad with no monitor attached, it's over 10 times faster, but there is one thing that we can do to help out with that, and that makes this a little more usable. If I grab a USB hub like this Oracle one that I have here, this is an HDMI output, 100 watts power delivery, and some USB ports for me to use, and the important thing to note is that the HDMI output will only do 4K at 30 hertz. Normally, I never suggest people use 4K at 30 hertz if you've got a 4K display because it is pretty janky, but in this instance, it's more of a hack to make this more usable. With this particular setup, it's gonna free up some of that bandwidth, and the good thing is it's not gonna run at 4K resolution. When I plug this in, it actually drops down to 1440p, which looks pretty good in my opinion. It's a little soft around the edges, but it stays at 60 hertz, and I'd rather sacrifice a touch of sharpness for that higher refresh rate. But most importantly, the transfer speed on the drive that I have attached to the hub is a lot more usable. If you already have a 1080 or 1440p monitor, you should already be fine. But for those with 4K displays, it's just something to be aware of. I don't know if this is gonna work the same on every hub, or maybe if you have a setting on your monitor or an older version HDMI cable where you can downgrade that resolution, but it is highly recommended unless you don't plan on using an external drive. 
With that external drive hooked up, you can see if I pop over to the Files app, I can see the drive in there. And this is perfect for photos or files that you just need to access or load a single time while you work on them. Or if you're taking on larger tasks like video editing, where a single project can go far beyond the internal storage on your iPad. In my own experience with video editing in particular, this is where things start to fall apart a little. I've been playing with Final Cut Pro for iPad, and while I do think that is a great little editor for people just wanting to do simple projects, it's not nearly as good as the desktop version. It is optimized for touch control, which is a plus, but there's no color grading options, and I just find it to be a bit clunky for things like creating keyframes with the anime tab and it just feels like it's lacking in some areas. You've also got the option to run the DaVinci Resolve app, which is much more fully featured, and you can do a lot more with it in terms of color grading and having access to a full-blown editor, but I found it to be somewhat unstable at times. It's gotten a lot better since its release, and I think it's a good entry point if you're just starting to get into content creation or video editing, but I still don't think that I'd want to use this as my full-time editing machine. It's not only clunky with the things that I just mentioned, but if I want audio with absolutely no lag, it's much more limiting, and I'm likely going to have to use the internal speakers as there is no headphone jack. Outside of editing, if you find yourself a good set of bookshelf speakers with Bluetooth 5.0 or above, latency generally isn't noticeable because you're not watching things frame by frame. If you're just watching content, you're likely not going to be able to tell, and the same goes for taking calls with wireless earbuds. If you are using this for more office use, the one nice thing is you can totally use the iPad in a desktop setup like this and hop into a Google Meet or Zoom meeting just fine. If you're using the internal camera, the placement can be a little awkward depending on where your iPad is sitting, but with iPad OS 17, you'll be able to use an external camera. So again, this is where we see things shifting into more of a fully featured desktop experience. The only catch to that as of right now is I believe the external camera will only work in FaceTime, but I'm sure that will probably expand to other apps as version 17 makes its way through a bunch of beta releases until it's actually released in the fall. Although iPadOS 17 is still in the earliest beta stages, I can already tell it's going to have a lot to offer in terms of making the iPad more desktop compatible. And I think given that iPadOS is just an operating system that's piggybacking on iOS, it does have some advantages and some disadvantages just in terms of how everything works. After using the setup a ton over the last couple of weeks, it's just generally been a positive experience for doing simple things where there's an extra level of separation between each application, but sometimes that disconnect can also be a weakness introducing more steps to do something, as can the touch first design. In terms of more intensive tasks like video editing, I think we still have a long way to go there. Regardless, it's still pretty crazy how much power is packed into these tablets now, and they've come a long way from just being a fancy e-reader. I think over time, it's pretty likely that we'll see more and more people replacing their laptops with an iPad, and if you are one of those people with done that already or you're considering doing something similar, let me know in the comments down below. That's it for me today. I hope you found this video useful or entertaining. If you did, feel free to give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more tech related content or have a hula hoop endurance contest, please subscribe. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next upload.